Well, well, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum origins are quite humble. It started in a little one-room office across the street inside the historic Lincoln Building, and it really was the brainchild of the late Horace Peterson, who approached Buck with this idea of then building what would be a Negro Leagues Hall of Fame. And Buck would say, oh no, Horace, we don't need another Hall of Fame. He felt wholeheartedly that if you were good enough, you should be recognized at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And so Horace responded back by saying, what would you suggest? Buck said, a Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. That started in that little tiny one room office in 1990. The office space couldn't have been any bigger than this area that we're standing in. And Horace and other guys like Buck O'Neill and a number of former Negro Leaguers who were still with us at that time. Sad to say they've all passed on now. All of those who were part of this effort here in Kansas City, we've lost them all. They literally took turns paying the monthly rent to keep that little office open. And of course, as I like to say with it, our hopes and dreams of one day building a facility that would pay rightful tribute to not only one of the greatest chapters in baseball history, but what now, three decades later, thousands upon thousands of visitors are discovering each and every year one of the most remarkable chapters in American history. And that's the rich, compelling, inspirational story of the Negro Leagues. Again, a story whose origins began right here in Kansas City, literally a stone's throw from the Black Archives there at the Purcell YMCA where it all began in 1920. So Kansas City is the fitting and rightful place for a museum dedicated to this subject. Now you know as well as I do, everybody believes that every museum should be in New York or Washington <laughs> DC, but this museum is exactly where it is supposed to be because the roots began right here in Kansas City. You know, and it had some uh, strong roots too. When you talk about people like Horace Peterson. Uh, Horace's dream, I'm going to take this off because it's smothering me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm double vaccinated, I'm good. Horace's dream was to make sure that Negro history, black history, was preserved. Uh, you do that better than anyone uh, in the country, in the world. And I tell people, uh, everyone I see, that Buck Hendrick is the person to be leading that museum. You're a genius. Uh, you're a genius. You not only established um, a museum that just now people from all over the country and literally all over the world come to see, but you've sustained it. Yes. And it's something yeah. that's going to continue. Yeah. And, 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 and I think you know we work in this world. <laughs> Building it is really the easy part. Keeping it is where the challenge lies. And, and we've been very fortunate. And, and I was very fortunate because I got to learn from this man. And, 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 and Doc, I tell everybody every chance I get, the smartest thing that I ever did, those years that I was there hanging on the coattail of Buckle Neal, I kept my mouth closed and I listened because there really was a lot of wisdom to impart, if you wanted it. He didn't force it on you, but it was there if you wanted it. And he's now been gone for 15 years. And I still find myself drawing strength from things that he shared with me, or when there are difficult decisions to be made or challenges, thinking back, what would Buck do? And, and it really does kind of help me. I tell people all the time, I talk to Buck almost every day. <laughs> <laughs> now, he doesn't always talk back to me, but I talk to him almost every single day. And so I, I had, he was my friend, my mentor, my confidant, and uh, I feel like he's been looking over my shoulder. He's been guiding my footsteps. And I know that there would have been a lot of people who, to try to step in the enormous shoes of Buck O'Neill, would have felt the weight of that, because you can't feel those shoes. I'm not naive enough to think that I could feel those shoes. And so they would see his presence as weight. I see his shadow as protecting me. 
Yeah, he protects me. He guides my footsteps. And, and we've been able to have some success. So I appreciate you saying that. And, and again, that's still the constant quest for any museum, but for cultural institutions like ours, it is doubly challenging to sustain them over a long period of time. And that's what we're both working for, is to try to make sure that these institutions are here for future generations to come and enjoy and learn and be inspired for years and years and years to come. Yeah, we, we hope for that. And you know, Buck um, had this magnetism where you felt like uh, not only that he was your friend, but that he was your relative. Yes. And uh, when I, my career before this was over at the college, at Johnson County Community College, and we would have him come over, and he would go, there's my niece. <laughs> and people would come and ask me, can you get your uncle back? <laughs> and I was like, hey honey, how you doing? And, and uh, we had a lot of baseball fans over there, and the all yes. he was. Immediately you felt that, you felt that positive vibes coming from him and that connection to people. Yeah. Um, and that it wasn't so much about him, no. because when he told stories, he talked about the other players. Exactly. And what they did, exactly. and what happened with them. It was random stories about him. Yeah. There was always about the other players, and, and you're right, he had become this star. Now, he had been a big star while he was playing in the Negro Leagues. But he became an even bigger star after Ken Burns reintroduced him to a legion of baseball fans through his epic documentary on the history of baseball. And Buck was the star of baseball. He really was. He was the star of baseball. And, and as I like to describe, he was, here was this very charming, gentle man who was telling these wonderful stories to baseball fans that they had never heard before, and he was doing it with a twinkle in his eye and a smile that lit up the screen, and America literally fell in love with Buck. I remind folks, he was 82 years old at that time, and God blessed him to live for another 12 years where he was literally gallivanting across this country as I like to say, preaching the gospel of the Negro Leagues and the virtues of his museum to any and everybody who would listen. And guess who was along for the ride? Hey. Old Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm hanging on his coattail or just the garment, uh, the, the hem of his garment, you could say. And, and uh, so I consider myself to be a disciple. And, and so now I get to preach the gospel of the Negro Leagues and the virtues of his museum to any and everybody who would listen and it's a tremendous honor to do so and so we're you know we carry on in his spirit and, and we're trying to do everything we possibly can to make sure that his museum is as healthy and whole as it can possibly be. And you're making big steps. <laughs> what other museum has an athletic team? <laughs> you know and that's what it's all about. How can we make history relevant? How do I take something in the Negro Leagues, which they haven't played in Negro Leagues baseball in over six decades, how can I make it meaningful to a new generation of young people who hopefully will identify with this story, certainly the life lessons that stem from this story? And for me, I think that's the challenge that any history museum and particularly a cultural institution, is how can we make it better? So to establish that partnership as we did with the former Kansas City t ball was a little minor league team that was here in Kansas City, and to boldly rebrand them as the Kansas City Monarchs was one of those steps in creating relevancy. You see a number of kids who had no idea who the Monarchs were walking around with Monarchs gear because they now see it through these young kids who are playing baseball. And as fate would have it, when we did this partnership, I told the, the team owner, Mark Brandmeyer, I said, now look, if you're going to be named the Kansas City Monarchs, you got to be good. You better win. You better win. <laughs> you better win. And as fate would have it, in their first season as the Kansas City Monarchs, they win the championship. Yeah. That Monarch spirit was absolutely alive and well. But no, we're really excited but then when we think about it from a standpoint of creating streams of perpetual revenue 
every institution is looking for that. And with museums and cultural institutions, that's rare, it's a rarity. And so to be able to have a partnership that will likely extend for 20 plus years, and knowing that there will be resources coming in over that time span to assist the museum in its growth and its programming and operations, you know, it's not necessarily a full-fledged security blanket, but it makes you feel a little scared. <laughs> sure, it makes you a little bit warmer. Exactly. <laughs> you have some leftovers. <laughs> 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 We're trying real hard. Uh, what about this? Um, I see a blending with the archives in this space, not just because Horace's picture is there, but you also have the Horace Peterson III Welcome Center. Yes. And, and I think that it's important for us in this space to make sure that we're all connected, that people see that uh, we're not competing against no, each no, other. No, 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 no. That we, we're together, we are. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and every opportunity that I get to tout what I think has really been an undervalued proposition from the standpoint that I believe we have one of, we've created a cultural campus. If you thought about this area like a college campus, you was on the campus, and you think about this wonderful dearth of cultural institutions that are in basically a two block radius of one another. Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, the American Jazz Museum, the Black Archives of Mid-America, the Urban Youth Baseball Academy, Alvin Ailey, Friends of Alvin Ailey, a Mutual Musicians Foundation, and a soon-to-be-built Buckle Neal Education and Research Center. I challenge everyone to think of another city in the country that has that level of cultural institutions within a two-block radius. And, and that is something that we should be embracing and celebrating as a city. Cultural tourism, as you know, is very valued and it was on the rise prior to this crazy pandemic that we've been going through. And here we have, I think, one of the most meaningful collection of cultural institutions anywhere in the country. And, and so, no, it's not competition. It is about trying to create an experience as meaningful experience for those who are coming to visit our city and for those who call Kansas City home. I agree. So what's special here? What, oh. what do you love the most? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's some of the kinds of nuanced kinds of things that you don't automatically grasp if you're walking through on your own, we're working on some things to kind of help that as well. So if I'm not around and one of my staff members are not around to actually take people on the tour. For instance, the chicken wire. There was, there was really a rhyme and reason for why we chose to use a chicken wire backstop to essentially separate our guests from the centerpiece of our exhibition, which is called the Field of Legends. Well, chicken wire was oftentimes a separating mechanism. So if black fans were allowed in to watch a major league game, this is how we were separated. So black fans would sit either down the left or right field lines, and we would be separated from white fans who sat in the rest of the ballpark, believe it or not, with a chicken bottle barrier. So we chose to use that same chicken wire to separate all of our visitors from the centerpiece of our exhibition. And, and, and I think our guests find that fascinating and it really does set the stage because I'm biased, obviously, but I think the Field of Legends is one of the most amazing displays in any museum anywhere in the world. These amazing life-size statues of Negro League Grace, and as you can see, they are cast and positioned as if they were playing a game. Well, they represent 10 of the first group of Negro leaders to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. So that's how our all-star team was chosen on the outside looking in almost poetically is the late great Buck O'Neill, the only one of our collection of statues that's not in the National Baseball Hall of Fame is a travesty that Buck is not in the Hall of Fame. But in this capacity, he is managing this all-star team that we assembled. So what we hoped would happen was that our guests would come in, peer through this old chicken wire backstop, see this incredible display, 
and we hope it gives you that desire that, oh, I can't wait to get out on the field. Walk amongst the statues, take my pictures with the statues, but here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, we segregate you from the field. We wanted our visitors, particularly my younger audience, to at least remotely experience what segregation was like. So in the case of these incredibly talented and courageous athletes, knowing full well that they were good enough to play in the major leagues, so close to it, yet so far from it. So from most vantage points in the museum, you can see the field, but you can't get to it. And so the only way that you are allowed to take the field here at the Negro League Baseball Museum, you have to earn that right. And you do so by learning their story. And by the time you bear witness to everything that they had to endure just to play baseball in this country, then the very last thing that happens is that you take the field. And in many respects, you're now deemed worthy to walk out on the field, as I like to say, with 10 of the baddest brothers to ever play this game. And our guests, they get it. They really do. When they get out there, there is this overwhelming sense of belonging, triumph, almost the way it was when Jackie took the field. Jackie Robinson took the field with the Brooklyn Dodgers, opening up now this opportunity for both black and brown players to play in the major leagues and with it opening up integration in our society. Oh, oh, it might as still growing. I, you know, I, I, I told the story here recently. I, I'm, I'm working. I'm a work in progress. I am trying to beat Mo Buck like I am. I'm working on it. But I still get mad every time I tell the story of how he didn't get in. And uh, the baseball world was disappointed. Yes. Yeah, the baseball, yes. entire baseball world was disappointed. Who handled it best? Fuck. Yeah, he handled it with the grace, class, and dignity that we all knew and loved him for. Yeah. yeah. So we got angry for it. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, we all got mad for it. <laughs> Now for me, this simple Bible verse taken from the Roman Catholic Bible Ecclesiastes that simply says, my son, if you aspire to be a servant of the Lord, prepare yourself for testing, set a straight course and keep to it, and do not be dismayed in the face of that person. That was Negro League's baseball in a nutshell. These athletes love the game of baseball so much that they were willing to endure whatever social adversity confronted them as they were traveling the highways and byways of our country just to play baseball. Their passion, though, would not only change our game, it would change our country for the better. And that's the story that we lay out in its greater context. So the story itself is set on a timeline of American history. Everything above the timeline is baseball related. What is captured inside the timeline and below it are what I like to refer to as historical reflections of things that were happening to African Americans at that particular juncture in our country's history. So really for our guests, it becomes an all-encompassing history lesson. You not only come here and witness the rise and subsequent fall of the Negro League, but you literally witness the social rise of America simultaneously. And those two things go hand in hand. And so there was a lot of thought that went into how we wanted to tell the story. You know, by museum standards, it's a relatively small footprint. 10,000 square feet of exhibit space that chronicles the story. But within those 10,000 feet is a lot of information. Yeah, it's a lot to consume in one helping because we probably make you read a little bit more than a lot of the newer museums that rely and so dependent on technology, touchscreen, this, this, and that. 
but we wanted to really immerse you back in town. Now we're adding other dimensions, you know, so that we can bring both of those worlds together. But we did. We wanted you to feel like you had walked back in time, that you into a period of time when people of our color were enduring tremendous hardships, but also celebrating tremendous success. Yeah, our success stories have rarely ever been talked about. Right. Yeah, the <laughs> downtrodden path aspect of our journey, seeking equality in this country, those have been well documented. But my success stories have rarely ever been talked about. The story of the Negro Leagues is one of those great American success stories. You won't let me play with you? Okay, I'll create my own. Yeah, yeah I'll create my own. And then there are those who will say that the league that I created was better than the league that wouldn't let me play. And, and, and that's why I think people are so drawn to this story. Uh, but as I, I, I tell people, what's not to love about the story of the Negro League? In my opinion, the Negro League embodies everything that is great about this country. Because it's about pride, it's about passion, it's about perseverance. It is about the refusal to accept the notion that you're unfit to do anything. So I'll show you. Yeah. And, and so while America was trying to prevent them from sharing in the joys of her so-called national pastime, it was the American spirit that allowed them to persevere and prevail. And that's what comes to life through this story. One of collection of photographs, artifacts, great scripted pieces. As I mentioned, if you were here on your leisure, you could spend the entire day here. And there are a lot of people who do. Yeah. They'll read every word, and if there's something misspelled, they're going to let me know. <laughs> Which I want them to. I want them to. We have to be held to a standard, you know, of making sure that the information that we provide is not only historically accurate, but accurate in every possible way. And, and while we always want to know the great things that we're doing, in order to be the great institution, you also have to know what you're not doing right. right. And so that feedback is just as vital to what we do as well. But people do. They'll come in here and they'll fully immerse themselves. They may leave briefly, go get some barbecue, and then come back and walk that barbecue <laughs> off by finishing this tour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell you this doesn't necessarily have to be in the film, but Bella McDaniels mm -hmm. sent me some panels and asked me if I would proofread them. So I did, and then I came in and went well, like, Tell them you missed a few. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or you, you didn't do what I told you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and I have heard, uh, back to this, I've heard Buck say that Jackie Robinson was not mm -hmm. the best player, but he was the best one to make Absolutely. that step. Absolutely. And, and there's no question about it. And that question is posed to me quite often Was Jackie the best player in the Negro Leagues? No. He wasn't the best player on his own Kansas City Monarch team. Jackie would join the Kansas City Monarchs in 1945, which again, a lot of baseball fans did not know. I think they think Jackie walked out of nowhere and just started playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers, but his real rookie season was 1945. And by the end of the 45 season, he was gone. But he wasn't the best player. He was the right player. There were other Negro League players who were far superior baseball players to Jackie Robinson at that time, but talent alone was not going to cut it. No, you had to have the right guy. And Jackie had what I like to refer to as the intangibles that better prepared him to deal with the racial hatred that that first player was going to be confronted with. Jackie had been a celebrated collegian, an all-American football player at UCLA. So he is college educated. He had served in the military. He's disciplined. He would become married to the beautiful Rachel Robinson. He's stable. All of those attributes would be called upon to deal with the racial hatred that he would be confronted with. Keep in mind, when he walks out on that field as a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers, he is called everything, but as my mother would say, but a child, child of God. God. <laughs> Absolutely. And when he came to the plate, they knocked him down continuously. As a matter of fact, the opposing team's pitchers would oftentimes get fined if they didn't knock him down. When he would slide into second base, he would oftentimes come up wet where the opposition had spit on him. 
when the opposition slid in the second, they came in Spike side trying to cut it. They did everything imaginable to break Jackie, but Jackie would not break. Some of those other Negro Leaguers, Doc, who had been so acclimated to segregation, they couldn't handle it. Had you thrown a black cat on the field when Willie Wells walked out on the field, his natural instinct would have been pick that black cat up, throw it right back where it came from, but the instant that you do that, the naysayers would have said, see, I told you they can't handle it. Uh -huh. And if he can't play, the naysayers would say, see, I told you they weren't good enough to play in this league. So Branch Rickey had a doubly difficult task of identifying the right guy because failure was not an option on either side of the equation. If he can't take the abuse, the experiment is over. If he can't play, the experiment is over. Yeah, so you had to have the right guy, and Jackie was the right guy. And speaking of the right guy, this is the legendary Andrew Rube Foster, the genius. It would be Rube Foster who would establish the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City in a meeting that took place at the old Purcell YMCA. The building still stands. It has now been designated as the future home of the Buckle Neal Education and Research Center. So we want to go full circle right back into the very building that gave birth to the story that we're now charged with preserving to convert it into an education and research center in memory of Buck. But it was Ruth Foster who was the mastermind who did what other Negro League owners had attempted to do but had failed to create a successful, organized black baseball structure. Root Foster was light years ahead of his time. Root Foster, in my opinion, is the absolute most brilliant baseball mind this sport has ever seen, and virtually no one knows who he is, even though he is rightfully enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He had been a great pitcher himself in the early era of black baseball. As a matter of fact, he is credited with having invented what we now know to be the screwball. Back then it was called a fadeaway. And Root perfected this pitch, uh -huh. but he was best known as a visionary, tremendous leader. He would organize the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City in 1920. He would become president of the Negro Leagues. He owned the Chicago American Giants and he managed the Chicago American Giants. And honestly, if you were looking at Root in any of those phases, Root Foster would have gone in the Hall of Fame as an owner, as a player and as a manager. That's why I say he's the most brilliant mind in baseball history and he is the architect behind creating what, we, what would eventually become this thriving black baseball business enterprise. Mm -hmm. Amazing. It, 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 it really is. Oh, and it was by him. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and then he died relatively young. And so we continue to work to bring things into the collection. That sweater is the oldest known garment from the Negro Leagues. Hmm. That sweater dates back to 1924 to the very first Negro League World Series. The ECL on the sweater stands for Eastern Color League. So when Ruth Foster formed the Negro Leagues in 1920, he formed the Negro National League. In 1923, this man, Ed Bolden, formed a rival league known as the Eastern Color League. Well, in 1924, you had your very first Negro League World Series, the Kansas City Monarchs against the Hilldale Daisies out of Darby, Pennsylvania. The Monarchs would go on to win that World Series, becoming our city's first major professional sports team champion of any kind in 1924. Well, if you look at the far right-hand side of this picture, there's that sweater. Yeah, the sweater was donated to the museum by former San Diego Padres owner, John Morris. Old Buck and I talked him into letting us bring it home and he was so gracious to do so because again, if this was up for auction today, opening bid might be 50 grand or better. We never would have had a chance to get it. It reminds me of the fact that we have almost become our own worst enemy. The more we popularize the story, we're driving up the price of these rare artifacts to the point that we can't compete <laughs> to go get them. 
you know, but Mr. Morris was so gracious to allow the piece to come home. Well, now the world gets to enjoy it as opposed to it sitting in someone's private collection where only a few select folks would ever get to see it. And then the other aspect of what I thought was very cool in how we wanted to interpret the story is that we just didn't focus on the baseball aspect of it. We wanted lifestyle to also be a prevalent part because we wanted our visitors to understand the economic aspect of black baseball. Negro Leagues Baseball was the third largest black owned business in this country. And uh, wherever you had successful black baseball, you typically had thriving black economies. And so you'll see those slices of life throughout the exhibition. This depicts the sitting room of the old street hotel. The street hotel was the black owned hotel right down on the corner of 18th Marcel here in the historic 18th and Vine Jazz District. And let me tell you, it wasn't a travesty to have to stay at the street hotel because if you were black and visiting Kansas City, this is where you stayed. It was the most majestic of maybe a couple of smaller hotels or you got a room at the Purcell YMCA which offered rooming uh, sleeping rooms in its space as well. And so you could walk into the sitting room of the street hotel on any given day and you might see sitting in one of those chairs former heavyweight boxing champion Joe Lewis or at that time the fastest man in the world Jesse Owens although Jesse Owens would never race the legendary Negro League of Cool Papa Bell <laughs> flat out refused to race Cool Papa Bell Jesse Owens would race horses around the bases but never Cool Papa Bell here's the great orchestra leader Lionel Hampton there's Hampton surrounded by members of the Kansas City Monarchs Hampton loved the Monarchs so much so that Buck O'Neill would put Hampton in a Monarch uniform he sit on the bench and serve as an honorary coach. That's the beautiful Lena Horn shown throwing out the first pitch at an all-star game. The legendary jazz musician Cab Calloway had his own semi-pro team. So did Louis Armstrong. As a matter of fact, General Colin Powell, when he visited the museum, told me that his father played for Louis Armstrong's semi-pro team. The Armstrong Secret Nine based out of New Orleans, as they would say. Interestingly enough, all the jazz musicians wanted to be baseball players. All the baseball players wanted to be jazz musicians. <laughs> so it was only fitting that they come together here at 18th and Vine, where you had the best of both worlds. But again, we wanted to showcase these lifestyle exhibits because we did want our guests to understand the economic impact that was yielded by black baseball. It wasn't uncommon that these athletes could go into a town fill up the ballpark and yet not be able to get a meal from the same fans who had just cheered them or not have a place to stay. So they would sleep on the bus and eat their peanut butter and crackers until they could get to a place that would offer them basic services. Well, businesses like the Street Hotel emerged to meet those needs. Negro Leagues Baseball brought them a built-in clientele that led those black owned businesses to their economic heights. If there is a bittersweet aspect to the overall story of the Negro Leagues, it lies in the fact that you can directly parallel the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues with the rise and fall of black economy in this country. And to a great extent, black economy never recovered from losing the Negro Leagues. So what was good morally, what was good socially, was devastating economically. As I share with my guests all the time, there is always a cost for progress. And black businesses paid a dear cost for what was deemed progress. This was good for the soul of our country. And it moved us in ways socially that we never ever dreamt of, but it came at a cost. Mm -hmm. The street hotel, was the first hotel to have white tablecloth service Ooh. for its patrons. <laughs> Reuben Street. Reuben <Yes>, Street! <laughs> We're going to do first class? First class. <laughs> wow. Yeah.
Yeah, you know, and that, that's a, a story that we don't always hear, is that integration, uh, although it was good for the country and in total, was not good for the life. It, 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 there were aspects of it that hurt. And it's still, we still feel the impact of that today because, in my estimation, what we wanted was equality. Right. We asked for integration. Yeah. You know, so the old adage, be careful what yeah. you ask for, you might get it. In some aspects, rang true here because now you were able to maybe patronize places that once upon a time didn't want you there but you still were seen as a second-class citizen in their eyes. And I think that's the quest and what we've been fighting, and hopefully these cultural institutions help bridge that gap, that you know we need to continue that fight for equality in this country for all citizens. And, and that's what makes cultural institutions so important. And, and we talk about, as we talk about the various cultures who are aligned with the Negro Leagues, we talk about what we call baseball. And it's the little known but very profound connection that the Negro Leagues had to Spanish-speaking countries. Negro League players were oftentimes the first Americans to play in many Spanish-speaking countries. And of course, the irony of it was when we went to those countries, we were treated like heroes. We're going to stay in the finest hotels those countries had to offer. You're going to eat in the finest restaurants, and then you come back home and you're treated like a second-class citizen. So as a result, a lot of Negro League players would call those Spanish-speaking countries home for one simple reason. In those countries, they weren't black baseball players. They were just baseball players. That's all they ever wanted to be. In this country, the dark-skinned Spanish-speaking athlete like Martin De Higo here, couldn't play in the Major League either. So he found sanctuary playing in the Negro Leagues. So when Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier, he doesn't do it for just American born blacks. He does it for every player of color who now enjoys our great sport. Not to here. <laughs> Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't exactly. stop here yeah. because this is my favorite photograph in the entire exhibition. <laughs> this photograph is of a young Henry Aaron leaving Mobile, Alabama, about to go join the Indianapolis Clowns in 1952. He couldn't weigh 150 pounds. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you can see that there's some doubt in his eyes. He told me, he says, I didn't know if I was leaving home to go play with kids my own age or grown men. And of course, as we know, he was leaving to go play with grown men. And at that time, Mr. Aaron was a skinny, cross-handed hitting shortstop. So in the case of Mr. Aaron, he was a right-hand hitter who was hitting with his left hand on top. That is unorthodox. The fear is that you would break your wrist hitting in that manner. Well, Henry Aaron is knocking the cover off the baseball in a highly unorthodox fashion. When he gets to the clouds, they put the right hand on top, and the rest, as we say, is history. He was shortly after discovered by the Boston Braves, who had become the Milwaukee Braves, who, of course, would become the Atlanta Braves, and Mr. Aaron will go down in this sport as one of the game's all-time greats, but it all began in the Negro Leagues. And I love this picture because I grew up in Georgia. He's my all-time favorite baseball player and my childhood idol as a kid growing up in Crawfordville, Georgia, about 80 miles east of Atlanta. And I had an opportunity to walk him through this museum, and we stopped here. And you'll notice that there's a little small duffel bag by his foot. And he told me, he says, Bob, I may have had two changes of clothes in that bag, a dollar fifty cents in my pocket, and a ham sandwich that my mama had made me going to go chase that dream. It worked out pretty well for the ham. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> And again, more, more lifestyle exhibits, typical hotel room scale down to size. Most of those rooms of that era had double beds in them, but they were fine accommodations. And there's old Satchel, the legendary Satchel Payton. Now, I don't know if he's coming or going, but he's looking rather dapper. <laughs> he's dapper. He's dapper. Gentleman dapper. <laughs>
And, and you could not tell this story without including the barbershop. The barbershop has always been a staple in black life, and believe it or not, one of the few black-owned businesses that survived losing Negro League baseball. The barbershop and the mortuary. It is no coincidence that both of those businesses remain to this day segregated businesses. Uh -huh. Now, Max Barbershop was a five-chair barbershop inside the street hotel. This was the era of dress. So everywhere you went, you went looking good. You know, your grandmother wouldn't go get the groceries if she didn't have her fineries on. She's gonna put her gloves and her hat, her pearls on, and, and going to the barbershop was no exception. So you went, you got your shoes shined, you got your nails done, you got a shave, you got your hair cut, and then of course you sat around and told lies. Now they still <laughs> lied in the barbershop. That will never change. They're solving all the world's problems right now inside the barbershop. <laughs> And then this is our most recent installation. And, and as you can well imagine, about the challenge that we have here is every time I want to tell a new story, I got to tear something up. You know, you know and, and yeah, I have to tear something up. But we tore it up to create what we now call Barrier Breakers. And the Barrier Breaker exhibit looks at all of the players who broke their respective Major League team color barriers. From Jackie Robinson joining the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947, through Elijah Pumsey Green being the last to complete the integration cycle, believe it or not, 12 years later with the Boston Red Sox. It took 12 years before every major league team had at least one black baseball player. And, and as we so typically do in our society, we always celebrate the first. We never remember the second. And if you're number 16, you can pretty much forget it. And for us, they all had their trials and tribulations as they were trying to create a pathway to pursue their major league career. It didn't get any easier for Pumpsy Green in Boston in 1959 than it did for Jackie Robinson in 1947 with Brooklyn. And guys like Larry Doby who would integrate the American League literally weeks after Jackie breaks the color barrier in the National League, Larry Doby integrates the American League with the Cleveland Indians He's almost an afterthought. Yeah. yeah, it's only been over the last decade that people have finally started to pay rightful tribute to Larry Doby's pioneering role. Larry Doby was 23 years old, literally thrown into a powder keg of racism. Yeah, but Larry Doby had the exact same pedigree that Jackie did. College educated, served in the military. You can see him here as a Navy man, proud Navy man. Uh -huh. He had the same pedigree, but he was just a baby. He really was. And, and so we decided that we should tell all of their stories. And that's what this new exhibit does. And it also chronicles what set the stage for integration in our sport. And if we were going to single, look at one single event that led to the integration of baseball, it would be World War II. Because here you had those young black soldiers dying fighting the exact same racism in another country that we were being asked to accept at home. And so this started this growing sentiment of if they can die fighting for their country, why can't they play baseball in this country? And that would ultimately lead us to Jackie Robinson being plucked away from the Kansas City Monarchs to become that chosen one to break baseball's six decade long self-imposed color barrier. And of course, there's old Buck. There's old Buck. And uh, Mr. Gates said, Buck thought he was cute. <laughs> Buck was cute. <laughs> but Buck was also serving in the Navy, Supic Bay, Philippines, during in the Navy. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. The only time I've ever heard Buck somewhat suffer, and Buck was the most optimistic, positive individual I've ever met in my life. He was the classic glass half full kind of guy. Where others would see the glass half empty, Buck always saw it half full. The only time I ever heard him somewhat southern when he talked about his war experiences. Because here they were fighting for a country that really wasn't fighting for them. 
Yeah. And when he'd come back home, the POWs were treated better than they were. The POWs are sitting in the front of the bus. They are relegated to the back of the bus, having served their country. And, and I would ask him, I said, but why did you want to fight? And as Buck, Vintage Buck O'Neill, very succinctly, but very pointedly, because we were American. And there's no greater way to prove being American than service to your country. And yet that service to their country still left them relegated as a second class citizen. And, and so then he go back to being typical Buck. You know, and so this is part of our effort to bring that story to life as well. I met a woman who was doing a program over in Western Kansas, and um, she's talking about when she was a young teenager, she worked at a restaurant. And it was, they were transporting prisoners of war across Kansas. And they would come to the restaurant. The prisoners of war could sit in the restaurant. In the dining room. The soldiers who were escorting them had to go around to the back. Yeah. Like, yeah. who's your enemy? Exactly. And, and, and I think that's what we want people to understand. And that was part of what triggered this growing sentiment for integrating our so-called national pastime. And not only does this exhibit look at the integration of baseball, but we also focus on the ma other major sports integration. Fritz Pollard would integrate the NFL and then become subjected to a quote-unquote gentleman's agreement that banned players of color from the NFL and then the NFL would re-break its color barrier with Jackie Robinson's UCLA teammate Kenny Washington. Woody Strode, Jackie Robinson, and Kenny Washington form one of the most amazing backfields yes. in collegiate football history. Woody Strode would become a great actor, and Kenny Washington also did some acting, but Kenny Washington would re-break the color barrier in the NFL, and of course Jackie Robinson would break the color barrier in Major League Baseball. So that was one heck of a backfield. Uh huh. And we also looked at the, the NBA. Earl Lloyd would integrate the NBA. He would be the first black to play in an NBA game with the Detroit Pistons, but the first black to sign a contract with this guy in the NBA, Nat Sweetwater Clifton. Sweetwater Clifton was a six foot eight inch first baseman for the Chicago American Giants. That's the kind of athlete that we're talking about that called the Negro Leagues home. Sweetwater Clifton signed that contract to play with the New York Knicks and had a great career with the New York Knicks. And this is my dear friend, the great Willie O'Ree, the first black to play in the National Hockey League. Now you'll find it ironic that Boston, Mr. O'Ree joins the Boston Bruins in 1958. Boston had a black hockey player before Boston had a black baseball player. <laughs> And, uh, That's their sport. <laughs> <laughs> and another one of the eye openers. Take us from the Spanish language. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Both both pieces are. Uh, and, and another one of the eye openers for a lot of our visitors, and it speaks to the equity and the inclusiveness of the Negro Leagues, was the fact that there were women who played in the Negro Leagues. Three pioneering women, Tony Stone. Mamie Peanut Johnson and Connie Morgan competed with and against the men in the 1950s. Tony Stone would actually take the roster place of the great Henry Aaron. So when the Braves signed Henry Aaron at the end of the 1952 season, in 1953, the Indianapolis Clowns signed Tony Stone. And then Mamie Peanut Johnson would join the Clowns, and eventually Connie Morgan, who held from Philadelphia. Mamie Johnson was a five foot three inch pitcher with a strong right arm. Uh -huh. And so they were all pioneers, women who competed with and against the men in the Negro Leagues. But there were also women leaders and executives in the Negro Leagues well ahead of Major League Baseball. Most notably, Effa Manley. Effa Manley and her husband owned the Newark Eagles, but it was Mrs. Manley who ran the day-to-day -day operations of that baseball team. And Doc, she knew the business of baseball as well as any man. Great talent play for her. My dear friend, the late great Monty Irvin, Larry Doby, Leon Day, Willie Wells, Raleigh Biz Mackey. These players are all in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. 
the late great Don Nuka should be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. All plays by Ethel Manning's New York Eagles. She's the first woman to be nominated and inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. So again, the Negro Leagues didn't care what color you were, and they didn't care what gender you were. Can you play? Do you have something to offer? And that's the way it is supposed to be. And that's why I wholeheartedly believe that the Negro Leagues embodies the, the American spirit unlike any story in the annals of American history. It is everything that America prides itself in being, she's not there yet. She's not there yet. But because she's not there yet, doesn't mean that she's not the greatest country in the world. It just means that there's still work left to be done. That's the work that we're doing. And that's the work that generations who will come after us will continue to do. That quest to make us the best that we can absolutely be. That's what we're trying to do as human beings. Become the best person that we can be. So why wouldn't we hold our country to that same standard? Can you run that battery? Is that what you're <laughs> These are our Hall of Fame lockers. Every time a Negro Leaguer is inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame, we unveil a new locker. Currently, there are 35 Negro League players and or officials who are enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. We dedicated this to Buck Ray, then his 90th birthday. And he didn't want us to do anything special because he didn't want to make the museum appear that it was about him, but we did it anyway. It was the first time we ever defied our late chairman, and we did it anyway. And in the rear of this case is Buck's Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor that anyone in this country can receive. That was bestowed posthumously to Buck in December of 2006. He died in October. As a matter of fact, October 6th of 2006. In December of 2006, President George W. Bush, in White House ceremonies, presented Buck's brother Warren with Buck's Presidential Medal of Freedom. The O'Neill family was so generous to allow the peace to come home, where now the world gets to enjoy it. And as if, you know, if Buck was still with us, he'd tell you, that's a long way from a guy who was the grandson of enslaved people who not only helped in part change in this country, but lived long enough to enjoy that change. And he just never stopped seeing the good in people. You know, and that's why he was so special. And I witnessed this everywhere that we travel, and we travel all over the country. If he didn't know you, he'd come over and introduce himself to you. My name is Buck O'Neill, what's yours? And by the time we were leaving, wherever we were going, those individuals would be sharing an embrace as if they'd known each other all their lives. He had an innate quality about him. I think it's the same innateness that you would see in a Mother Teresa, a Gandhi, a Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, you know, that same kind of innateness that allowed them to universally love everyone. Yeah, even through their flaws. They were all flawed as human beings. But they were able to love, and Buck was able to, that, that love exuded from them. And then you finally make your way to the feet. Greeted by the jersey display and these incredible nighttime bronze sculptures. I'm so sorry about the carpet of land. That's all right. We'll get them next time. We'll get them next time. But I love that new bronze jersey. New, new Buckle Hill signed Lou to his first contract with the Chicago Cubs. And so Lou was like a son to Buckle. And, and became very close to me, and I was deeply honored that his wife Jackie had to speak at his funeral service when he passed away last year. I was still heartbroken. Yeah, we're still heartbroken. Now, Lou, Lou was a fixture here at this museum. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. 
Lou and Ernie back and bump signed them both to the Cubs. And then of course they traded Lou to St. Louis as one of the worst trades in baseball history. For Dirt Arnold and Ernie Brody. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Finally make your way to the field, you read about the jerseys, they be incredible. The life size, all the soldiers, and of course on the field, on the mound by the legendary New York Sun. He's arguably the greatest pitcher this sport has ever seen. We know for certain the oldest rookie in the history of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball says that Satchel was 42 years old when he joined the Cleveland Indians in 1948 as a rookie. Cleveland, you may recall, would win the World Series. By Cleveland Indians, now Cleveland Guardian fans, they renamed the team, well, we will rename the team to begin the next season. They get tired of hearing me say that was the last time Cleveland won the World Series <laughs> was 1948 with Satchel and the great Larry Doby. And many thought Satchel should have been named Rookie of the Year. Satchel didn't get called up to Cleveland until July of 1948. And he goes six and one with a 2.4 ERA his rookie season at age 42, which means he was likely closer to 52. He never told his real age. And quite frankly, y'all, I don't think Satchel knew his real age. As a matter of fact, encased in glass in the corner is his original tombstone. And when you go to the tombstone, you'll see that there's a question mark by his birthday. He literally took it with him to his grave but as I tell my guests all the time, there will never, ever, ever be another Leroy Satchel page. Not someone who combines the longevity by his estimation. He pitched in over 2,600 games. The great stuff. Recorded some 55 no-hitters and only God knows how many strikeouts. And the charisma. He can sell it. Yeah, he can sell it. But he can also back it up. And, and, and Satchel... Satchel was essentially Muhammad Ali before we ever knew who Muhammad Ali was. And he had names for his pitches. So he didn't have fastball, curveball, changeup, no who, not Satchel. Satchel had what he called his midnight creeper. He had the two humper. He had the back dodger. He had the hesitation pitch. He had the long tom, the short tom, the jump ball, the trouble ball, the radio ball, the wobbly ball, the dipsy doo. And he also had his famous pitch that he called his B ball. And the reason that he called it the b-ball was that Satchel says, it bees where I want it to be when I want it to be there. And so I tell all my young major league pitchers, they need to develop themselves a b-ball. But as Satchel would also say, there were a lot of Satchel pages that played in the Negro Leagues. And it's so fitting that we now have a place where their contributions not only to the sport are being remembered, but their contributions to our country. And it's at a time, as you well know, when there are only a handful of these legendary athletes still with us. They are like World War II vets. Many of them were World War II vets. And so what essentially stood at risk was that this story was going to die when that last Negro nigger left the face of this earth. We cannot allow that to happen. And that's the importance of these cultural institutions. Our children deserve to be able to come to a place and see people who look just like them, who made indelible contributions to our society, yet their stories have never been fully documented. And, and to gain an even greater sense of self. And so we're proud to be a partner with the Black Archives of Mid-America in this quest of doing just that. Can't allow the best stories to be in the cemetery. No, we cannot. <laughs> <laughs> you are amazing. This is fabulous. We appreciate you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure yeah. and it's an honor. Oh, it's, it's an my absolute honor. honor. Thank you all. Thank you so much.